Good day everyone. My name is Mr. Chitim. Today we'll be looking at the hip joint. We'll be looking at the hip joint. So this is the hip joint here. This is the hip joint. So there is a laid down guideline that we will follow and we will take it step by step. So the first thing we'll be looking at in the hip joint is this diagram here. We can see this is the hip joint. This is the hip joint here. And coming to the definition of the hip joint, the hip joint is defined as a ball and socket type of synovial joint that is formed between the pelvic bone and the femur. It is formed between the pelvic acetabulum and the head of the femur. So I repeat, it is a ball and socket type of synovial joint that is formed between the pelvic bone and also the femur. The hip joint is a joint that bears the weight of the upper body. So it bears the weight of the upper body. So we'll be looking at the articular surfaces. We'll be looking at the articular surfaces. So this is the pelvic bone here, and this is the femur. This is the acetabular fossa of the pelvic bone, while this is the head of the femur. So the articular surface for the hip joint is formed between the acetabular fossa of the pelvic bone or the pelvic gedo and also the head of the femur. So this is it. This is how the articulating surfaces are. Then in the articular surface, there is a fibrocartilaginous collar that is found in the acetabular fossa. And the name of this fibrocartilaginous collar is known as the acetabular labrum. It is known as acetabular labrum. It helps in the stability of the hip joint, or rather, it helps to hold the hip joint in shape or in position or in place. Then you can see that the acetabular fossa is a cup like concave structure. You can see, and it is very deep, as you can see here. And having seen that it contains the acetabular labrum, it also contains the articular. The cartilage. All these things help in the stability of the hip joint. The synovial membrane lies in the articular surface of the hip joint. It lies in the articular surface of the hip joint. So the synovial membrane lies here around the head of the femur, between the head of the femur and also the neck of the femur. There is a line here where the synovial membrane lies. And what does the synovial membrane do in the articular surface? The synovial membrane helps in producing the synovial fluid. And this synovial fluid helps in lubricating the hip joint so as to reduce friction during movement of the hip joint. You know that if there is no duplication to this joint, you notice that friction will be high and the, the, the pain between this articular surface will be terrible. So the synovial fluid produced by the synovial membrane helps in lubricating these joints in order for free movement of the joints. So apart from the acetabular labrum, the articular cartilage and the synovial membrane, we also have the joint capsule in the hip joints. All these things help in the stability of the hip joint. Then having seen the articular surfaces, let's go over to the ligaments of the hip joint. In the hip joint, we have the intracapsular ligament and the extracapsular ligament. The intracapsular ligament is only one ligament, which is known as the ligament of the head of the femur. So this ligament of the head of the femur lies here in this hole in the head of the femur. So it lies here in order to reflect in the acetabular fossa. It lies here and attaches firmly in the acetabular fossa. And you know what a ligament does? 
ligament connects one bone to another bone. So having seen that this joint has to do with two bones coming together, you notice that the ligament of the head of the femur lies in the fovea capitis femoris here now, and it attaches in the acetabular fossa, holding the hip joint together very firmly. So that is it for the intracapsular ligament. Then coming to the extracapsular ligament, we have three ligaments there. We have the iliofemoral ligaments. We have the bubofemoral ligament, and we also have the ischiofemoral ligament. So the iliofemoral ligament is a ligament that, like I told us, these are extracapsular after the joint capsule. So the iliofemoral ligament lies between the anterior inferior iliac spine here. This is the anterior inferior iliac spine. It lies from here to the intertrochanteric line. So it connects from here to the intertrochanteric line. This is the intertrochanteric line from anterior inferior iliac spine to the intra to a canteric line. You can see how it helps to hold this joint together. Then we also have the pubofemoral ligament. The pubofemoral ligament lies in the superior pubic ramus. This is the superior pubic ramus here. It lies in the superior pubic ramus and it attaches in the intertrochanteric line also. You can see also how it connects these two bones together. Then we now have the ischiofemoral ligament. The ischiofemoral ligament lies between the body of the ischium. This is the body of the ischium. Here. It lies between the body of the ischium and the greater trochanter of the femur. So these are the three extracapsular ligaments. You notice the difference between the intracapsular ligament and the extracapsular ligament. The intracapsular ligament lies within the joint capsule that I told us about, while the extracapsular ligament lies after the joint capsule, covering the joint capsule. Although this ligament connects one bone to another. Then let's see the movements of the hip joints. In the hip joint, we have flexion of the hip. So, flexion is there, extension of the hip is there, then we also have abduction of the hip. We have abduction of the hip, we have medial rotation and also lateral rotation. So, these are the six movements that can be found in the hip joints. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, medial rotation and lateral rotation. So we are going to be looking at the muscles that forms or that moves this joint. As this movement, six movement that I pronounced or that I made mention of, it's, the joint doesn't move on its own. It is a muscle that contracts in order to move these joints. So we are going to be looking at the muscles that move or that is involved in each of the movements. So coming to flexion, the muscle that flexes the hip, we have the iliosohas muscle, that is the iliacus and the sohas major muscle. It helps to flex the hip. We have the rectus femoris muscle. We also have the pectineus muscle. They all flexes the hip. Then coming to extension of the hip, we have the gluteus maximus, we have the semimembranosus and semitendinosus muscle. So, coming to the abduction, we have the gluteus minimus, we have the gluteus medius, and we have the tensor facial latter. Coming to abduction, in the abduction, we have the adductor longus, the adductor brevis, and the adductor magnus. Coming to lateral rotation, we have the gluteus maximus, then coming to medial rotation, 
we have the Bluetooth medius, Bluetooth minimus. This is it about the movement of the hip joint. Then the blood supply, the artery supplying the hip is the medial and the lateral circumflex femoral artery. The medial circumflex femoral artery runs medially and the lateral circumflex uh, femoral artery runs laterally. Then coming to the nerve supply, we have the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve helps to uh, innervate the heat and also the obturator nerve. Then stabilizing factors. When we talk of stabilizing factors, we mean the different factors that contribute to the stability of the hip joint. The reason why the hip joint is stable. So the first stability factor is this cup-like acetabular fossa. You can see the cup-like acetabular fossa is very deep. This is the first stability factor here. Then the second stability factor is the ligament of the head of the femur. This ligament that lies here is the second stability factor. Then other ligaments also plays a role in the stability of the hip joint. Then we also have the joint capsule. The joint capsule also helps in the stability of the hip joint. Then have you seen the stability factor? Let's go over to the clinical coordinates. Like every joint in the body, this location is one of the problem of the hip joints. But in the case of the dislocation of the hip joint, we have congenital dislocation and acquired dislocation. Congenital dislocation simply means, when we talk of congenital, we mean before birth. So this dislocation or this, the reason for this dislocation happens before birth. So you can see that the you can see the deepness of the acetabular fossa, but in congenital dislocation, the there is a malformation in the development of the acetabular fossa. Instead of being very deep, remember that it plays a role in the stability of the hip joint. Instead of being very deep, it becomes shallow. And in that case, knowing that the hip joint is a weight-bearing joint, in that case, dislocation is bound to happen. Then coming to acquired dislocation, this can be a result of trauma or a result of force, irrespective of the fact that dislocation of the hip really happened. Quite all right, it really happened. But in the case of acquired dislocation, it can be as a result of force, accident, trauma. And we have the anterior acquired dislocation and the posterior acquired dislocation. In the case of posterior acquired dislocation, the head of the, because of trauma, the head of the femur moves posteriorly, moving out of the acetabular fossa. Then in the case of anterior acquired dislocation, the head of the femur moves anteriorly out of the so that is the case of dislocation. So we've come to the end of this teaching. I'll encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Learn with Chisum Grades. Also follow me on Facebook, Learn with Chisum Grades. Follow me on TikTok, Chisum underscore Grades. Like this video, share this video to your friends, and comment on this video. Thank you very much.